The modern meaning of the English word chair is simple enough. A single person's seat. To the extent it possesses any architecture, such a throne is inferred to be made by hand. Likewise, to the same degree, such an elevated seat provides an air of authority to the seated. Thus, the verb form of the word, to chair, denotes playing a respected role. Although the concept of an artificially constructed or man-made sitting place has existed since prehistoric times, the term for such a seat or throne in modern English is only as recent as Old French, the language spoken in northern France from the 700s until the 1300s AD. There, our modern word chair, derived as a comparable term to the Greco-Roman word for the same idea. The Greek and Latin word for chair had, by the period of the Old French language, already evolved to have a very different meaning than it originally conveyed. In modern Western civilization, we associate the term cathedral most obviously with a large, Roman Catholic Church building. Within Roman Catholicism, such a building is the headquarters of a bishop who oversees a regional diocese of smaller satellite church buildings, each with its own local denominations. From its earliest structuring in the Catechism, ostensibly the constitutions of the Roman Catholic religion. The hierarchy and government of this faith's priestcraft was established. Herein, from the Italian Latin word appropriated from the Greek, meaning chair, later, Church Latin applied this word as a term for the building associated with their rank and file role called bishop. Thus, the chair of the office of each bishop is in a cathedral building. Our current concept of a car as a wheeled conveyance for a chair in which a driver sits, controlling the tires by a steering wheel, may be a contrivance of the 20th century A.D., but the notion of mechanically assisted motion of a passenger is one of the earliest inventions recorded in written human history, combining the taming of the wild horse accomplished by the Eurasian steppe bowtie culture some 5,500 years ago and the invention of the wheel roughly contemporarily during what we call today the Copper Age, some 6,500 until 5,300 years ago. These carts for carrying people have been referred to as chariots from the Middle English period, 1066 until the 1400s AD, onward, and have always come in a wide variety of models from amply horsepowered, upright piloted racers to coach-drawn carriages for a recumbent commute. The Middle English term chariot, in turn, derived from the old northern French term carré, which derived, in its turn, from the Latin carum or carus, all of which had the same basic meaning, a cart for carrying people. The term cart meant the carriage part of the vehicle, 
as opposed to its conveyance. That is, in ancient times, its harnessed horses or the hand bearers of the litter, or in modern times, the vehicle's motor. Thus, the wheel, the axle, and chassis all had to be invented before it in order to be combined into the body of such a land vehicle. Even prior to its being used as a means of human transportation, by around 5,000 years ago. The Latin word carum or carus, the branch from whence stemmed the Middle English cart and late Middle English chariot, was itself a derivative from an earlier linguistic trunk, although here it becomes somewhat less clear in terms of direct historical lineage. Just as we trace the root of chariot back to the term cart, we can trace the root of cart back to the term car, the root of the Latin term carum. Modern etymology can merely speculate on the exact origins for the term car as the root of the Latin term carus, because, at this point, the term does not appear to be derived from any of the usual original sources for Latin terms. Being in the Greek and neighboring Mediterranean regions, but instead from the northern European regions that were conquered by the Romans from the time of the first Celtic sack of Rome, 390 until 387 BC, until General Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon to return to Rome in 49 BC. This dwarfed the Punic Wars, 264 until 146 BC, between Rome and Carthage, a Phoenician kingdom on the northern coast of Africa, just across the Mediterranean from Sicily, an island off the southern coast of Italy, that led to the origin for the military tactic Salted Soil, when Rome intentionally polluted the fertility of their enemies' farmlands, ruining them to crops for centuries. The Punic conflict was puny and tame beside the prolonged and bloody conflict between Rome and the European Celtic tribes. Thus, when Rome was finished conquering these early European Gauls, Gaelics, Celts, Germanics, Anglo-Saxons, etc., they assimilated some aspects of their cultures, destroyed the rest, and left no record of which was which. This effectively disbanded the Celtic cultures, and resulted in the loss of the details of their druidic faith until this very day, leaving our anthropological scholars now to research a conquered people using relatively few artifacts as resources. This may be why modern etymologists place the word origin for the root term car in the Celtic and, in particular, the Irish realms from prior to the final Roman Gallic Wars from 58 until 52 BC. Although there does appear to be a phonetic homonym of the term car in ancient Celtic Irish, it has a very different meaning. While in Old Norse, the term carter meant cart, in Celtic Irish, the term kara meant friend. In this sense, it occurs most commonly in the Celtic Irish concept of the anamchara, or soulmate. This may be a mistake on the part of modern etymologists in connecting the Latin term carum or carus to the Celtic Irish word cara insofar as they have different meanings, or it may be due to the apparent similarity in Indo-European languages between later European concepts such as the 
coterie, 1700s French, meaning a circle of friends, and earlier Sanskrit concepts such as the chakra, meaning a wheel or circle. Cognate in between these eras to the Greek term kuklos, meaning cycle. In Hebrew tradition, particularly that of Kabbalah, Hebrew mysticism, the concept of a chariot has been an important symbol, like what Zoroastrians call the Faravarhar, or what Vedics call the Vimana, a kind of ship that transports God. Thus, in Hebrew mystical tradition, the divine throne chariot literary cycle has persisted from at least its initial implication in Ezekiel chapter 1 until the present day. The modern Hebrew word for chariot is Merkava, and its root term in ancient Hebrew, Semitic language, Aramaic alphabet, was Resh, Kaf, Beth, which means to ride. So it is notable that, taking this root term, ur kaba, and adding the letter mem to the beginning of it, as in the term merkava, the meaning is changed from the active verb to ride to the passive noun chariot, that which is ridden. Explaining events from around 593 until 571 BC, during the Babylonian exile, the book of Ezekiel's first chapter sets down the appearance of God to his prophet in a great vehicle, which is described in some detail, although left vague in its wording and seemingly impossible to exactly replicate in the form it apparently depicts. This passage on God's vehicle gained great significance with the diaspora following their exile from Judea and the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 AD. Having its own extremely detailed theurgy, angel summoning ritual magic, the Merkaba mystical tradition ultimately yielded a compelling compendium compiled by scholar Gershom Scholem in 1965 A.D. This tome, called The Work of the Chariot, lists manifold names of angels and servitors that may be summoned using rituals also given in the passages of its text. However, it appears to do little by way of adding to the original visions in Ezekiel of God's vehicle, or the divine throne chariot itself. In Ezekiel's first vision, we are introduced to nearly all the orders of angels attributed as such in the cosmogony of HaKabalah. The Hyot, divine living creatures, are usually seen as symbols of the seasons, cardinal directions, terrestrial elements, etc. The cherubim, male demigods with wings. The ophanim, or wheels within wheels. And the seraphim, fiery or burning angels, flashing like lightning. From the 530s BC until around 100 BC, there was an increase in apocalyptic literature and eschatological faiths within Second Temple era Judea. This culminated, ultimately, in the 70 AD Siege of Jerusalem, led by the future Roman Emperor, 
Titus Flavius Caesar Vespasianus Augustus. However, just prior to this event, we find the historical accounts of the Synoptic Gospels describing the person of the Christian Messiah, Jesus the Christ. In fact, from the era of Jesus' own lifetime, a document known as the Angel Scroll of Yeshua ben Padia persists and likely describes an ornate angelology unique to its texts. Although at present it remains suppressed and has not yet been published. This angel scroll of Ben Padia may contain a key missing piece in Merkaba mysticism and Hecalot, or palaces, literature from this pivotal period in its history. The concept of karma is an ancient Harappan idea dating from 3300 until 1300 BC in the Indus River Valley region of modern-day India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Therefore, the idea it conveyed to the minds of people then in that culture may be very different from any we have words to describe in our culture today. Nevertheless, its usage as a term in that region has been continuous ever since, and as such its meaning has remained more or less a constant throughout that whole time as well. What this term connotes in English words, approximating Western civilization's historical precedence, is simply enough cause and effect, or, even simpler, consequences. In 1600s A.D. England, Isaac Newton, apparently acting independently of any knowledge of the Sanskrit term, incorporated this concept into his Three Laws of Motion as the third principle. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. This, to the Westerner, explains karma. In its oriental origins, the term karma derived from the Sanskrit word karman, which meant in the Rig Veda and other Vedic texts, simply enough, to do, as in, to make happen, to perform, or to carry out, etc. In this sense, it denoted the deed in itself as well as connoted the doer, such that karman meant both what is done and the one who does. The best measurement for translating this concept into Western terms derives from the 1848 A.D. Communist Manifesto of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Their definition of the premise of labor power, or work units, potential energy capacity expendable by any one individual worker, is, it is highly likely, most like the notion the term Carmen inferred to its ancient inventors. Each unit of karma may be seen as either positive or negative, good or bad, right or wrong, yin or yang, etc. The sum total of all karma events in the universe, the ancient Vedics called Rita, meaning rule, truth, order, etc. The description of how karma functions in Rita was called the Dharma, and the rules of the Dharma were, to the Vedics, much like the laws of physics are to modern Western scientists. Hence the Karma, or Quanta, and the Dharma, or laws, 
comprised the whole of the Rita, the entirety of existence. In a sense, Rita was like the forward flow of time as entropy, and karma, the expression of this on a micro scale as each individual cause and effect event. If an event is in keeping with the Dharma, laws of nature, then it is beneficial karma or action. But if it opposes this flow of Rita, then that karma or deed is harmful. Hence, good karma is in harmony with the cosmic Rita, and evil karma is merely in discord. Radiocarbon dated as being between 12,000 and 10,000 years old by now. The temple complex at Gobikli Tape, Potbellied Hill, in modern Turkey, is currently the oldest known megalithic structure. Its geographical proximity and architectural likeness to the Kurgan culture of the Caucasus Mountains range, some 6,000 to 5,000 years later, may indicate it as a focal nexus point from which this later culture emanated. Although the term Kurgan is Turkish and means fort, it has been assigned to unify a wide range of megalithic mound-building cultures across Eurasia from roughly 6,000 until 4,000 BC. In this context, the term Kurgan is taken in its Cyrillic Russian sense as meaning a tumulus or burial mound. The Kurgan culture, thus, spanned the Pontic Caspian steppe north of the Black Sea, was responsible for the taming of the horse and invention of the wheel, and could have been classified as the first worldwide cultural empire of prehistoric times lacking only centralized leadership to qualify as being exactly that. Albeit considerably less civilized by our modern notion of the concept than the further south and more sedentary contemporary Mesopotamian, Nile River, and Indus Valley cultures, the Kurgan culture apparently made up in technical knowledge of stonemasonry what they may have, apparently, lacked in city planning and social castes. The architecture of the Kurgan tumuli, for which the culture is named, is basically a single megalithic hinge or gateway with twin upright menhirs as walls and a single tabletop eaves stone as roof. These structures were then buried underground. In some cases, they may have served as houses for the semi-nomadic living as well, but in all, they appear to have served primarily as final tombs for burying the dead. Around 4,500 years ago, or 2,500 BC, contemporary to the early dynastic era of Sumer in Mesopotamia, and to the erections of the Giza necropolis in Egypt and of Stonehenge in England, the Proto-Indo-European language-speaking Yamnaya culture of what is modern-day Ukraine began a gradual migration from the Pontic Caspian steppe into Central Europe, thus informing the Makop and Corded Ware cultures. These Yamnaya people emerged 3,300 until 2,600 BC as an admixture of Western migrating 
hunter-gatherers from the Siberian Multiburate culture from around 24,000 years ago and a pocket of Ice Age isolationists in the Caucasus Range between the Caspian Sea to the east and the Black Sea to the west around 13,300 until 9,700 years ago. From around 8,000 until 6,000 years ago, the Kurgan culture, combining the European corded ware, the Pontic Caspian steppe, Yamnaya, and the Georgia Russia region, Maykop, represented a single, vast, linguistically unified, Proto-Indo-European decentralized empire. Proto-Indo-European language was spoken from 4,500 until 2,500 BC across the entirety of this domain. This Kurgan culture arose with the advent of horse-drawn chariots and declined into pastoral herding farmers. They were the earliest, now known of, megalithic tumulus builders, and very likely influenced all the rest, including the earliest Mastabas of Egypt. <laughs>